Ms. Mobley, please present the speaker, Mr. Chadwick Bozeman. Let's do this. <laughs> Mr. President, I have the honor to present Mr. Chadwick Aaron Bozeman to receive at your hand the honorary degree of Doctor of Humane Letters. Chadwick Aaron Bozeman, quintessential artist, actor, director, writer. Your unique ability to completely embody the characters you chose to portray on screen and stage has created a phenomenal global sensation in the world of film and entertainment unlike any in recent history. Beginning with your work in the film 42 in 2013 as the legendary Jackie Robinson, who broke the color line in Major League Baseball by signing with the Brooklyn Dodgers at a time in America when blatant racism was rampant. And I told Ch Chadwick last night that Jackie Robinson and Martin Luther King Jr. received honorary degrees on the same day right here at Howard University as well. <laughs> to your exquisite true to life depiction of the godfather of soul, Mr. James Brown in the film Get On Up, and in 2017, your brilliant role in Marshall, which you co-produced about the iconic civil rights lawyer and first African-American Supreme Court Justice, fellow Capstone alumnus Thurgood Marshall, you have blazed a powerful new path in the world for the presentation of our rich lives of triumph over adversity that have been so sorely ignored for centuries. In this blockbuster year of 2018, audiences and critics around the globe have heralded your magnificence as T'Challa, Black Panther. In the feature film of the same name, and the entire movie has set a fire in the hearts and minds of people of all colors, creeds, and races, the likes of which has never, before, has never been seen before. You said that you had written in a journal years ago your desire to be the Black Panther, the world is in worship of Wakanda, the fictitious, technologically advanced, and mineral-rich African nation ruled by the Black Panther, who is based on a Marvel Comics character, which debuted just over a half a century ago. Also in 2018, you reprised your role of T'Challa Black Panther in Avengers Infinity War, which is the fastest film ever to pass $1 billion globally. You came to Alma Mater as an undergraduate of T.L. Hannah High School in your hometown of Anderson, South Carolina, where you were reared in a loving, supportive home by your mother, Carolyn, and father, Leroy Bozeman. Having written and performed plays in your junior year, your focus was initially on directing, and you earned a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree in directing in 2000. You were fortunate to have taken classes from the acclaimed Felicia Richard, who raised the funds for you and fellow classmates to attend the British American Drama Academy in London. While your plan was to hone your talents as a writer-director, it was your exposure to Rashad's teaching that opened you to the fruits of acting as well. Settling in New York, you began your career teaching drama at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture in the Junior Scholars Program in Harlem in 2002. You landed your first television role on Third Watch in 2003, and had a series of other roles on CSI, CSI, New York, Law and Order, and ER, to name a few. While continuing to write plays, you felt it was possible to do it all despite your agent pressing you to choose one artistic area of focus. Ultimately, you did see the value in this advice, even though you had success with Deep Azor, based on the tragic true story of Howard alarm Prince Jones, who was murdered by a Prince George's County police officer. Your decision to move to Los Angeles in 2008 opened the way for more achievements, as with your role in the television series, Lincoln Heights, then your first feature film, The Express, and a regular role in Persons Unknown in 2010. Other films included The Kill Hole, released just before 42, in which you starred opposite Harrison Ford, Draft Day with Kevin Costner in 2014, and Gods of Egypt, in which you played Thought. Chadwick A. Bozeman, beloved son of Alma Mater, your dedication to excellence, your pioneering, indomitable spirit, and motivated commitment to your craft stands as the hallmarks of your incredible life and career. You are a shining exemplar of our cherished core values of leadership, excellence, truth, and service. It is with heartfelt respect 
and loving gratitude that we salute and honor you as orator on the historic occasion of our 150th commencement, conferring upon you the degree Doctor of Humane Letters Honoris Causa. Congratulations. Ladies and gentlemen, I have the distinct honor to present to you our 2018 Commencement Convocation keynote speaker, Dr. Chadwick Boseman. As you just heard, he is a true son of Howard, and Dr. Boseman refined his extraordinary talents right here as an undergraduate student under the mentorship of many remarkable people who have passed through these these halls. Dr. Bozeman possesses all of the qualities that we embodied. And even when the lights are turned off and there are no cameras, those qualities continue to shine brightly. And so it is for this reason I'm pleased to introduce the commencement orator, Dr. Chadwick Bozeman. First, giving honor to the Creator and my ancestors on whose shoulders I stand. Happy Mother's Day to my mom. She is not here in attendance, but, but by tomorrow she will have seen this. <laughs> Let me also acknowledge my professors who have passed on to the other side. Because of work obligations over the past few years, I miss memorials that were held here for them. Professor Al Freeman, Jr., Professor Mike Malone, <laughs> Professor Reggie Ray, Dr. Henrietta Edmonds, Professor Joe Selman, Dr. Johnson, and Dr. Singleton. Professors and instructors that may be present, George Epstein, Tony Starnes, <laughs> Denise Saunders, Professor Roberts Williams and Professor Vera Katz. Your lessons continue to guide and, and enlighten me to this day. To President Wayne Frederick and the Board of Trustees, thank you for bringing me back here and giving me this distinguished award. It's overwhelming to be recognized amongst this year's other honorees. I can think of no better place to be right now after the Black Panther and Avengers campaigns, than to return and participate in these gradu graduation ceremonies with you. It is a great privilege, graduates, to address you on your day, a day marking one of the most important accomplishments of your life to date. This is a magical place, a place where the dynamics of positive and negative seem to exist in extremes. I remember walking across this yard on what seemed to be a random day, my head down, lost in my own world of issues, like many of you do daily. I'm almost at the center of the yard. I raised my head and Muhammad Ali was walking towards me. Time seemed to slow down as his eyes locked on mine and opened wide. He's raised his fist into a quintessential guard I was game to play along with him, to act as if I was a worthy opponent. What an honor to be challenged by the GOAT, the greatest of all time, for a brief moment. His face was as serious as if I were Frazier in the Thriller in Manila. His movements, his movements or flashes of a, of a past greater than I can imagine. His security let the joke play along for a second before they ushered him away 
And I walked away floating like a butterfly. I walked away amused at him, amused at myself, amused at life for this moment that almost no one would ever believe. I walked away light, ready to take on the world. That is the magic of this place. Almost anything can happen here. Hey, Chu. You. <laughs> Howard University. I was riding here and I, I heard on the radio somebody call it Wakanda University. <laughs> but it has many names, the Mecca, the Hilltop. It only takes one hour, one tour of the physical campus to understand why we call it the Hilltop. Every day is leg day here. <laughs> That's why some of you have cars. During my junior and senior years, I lived in a house off campus at Bryant Street. For those of you, that's right, Bryant Street. <laughs> For those of you who don't know what that means, that's at the bottom of, of the hill where the incline gets real. Almost every day I would walk the full length of the hill to fine arts where most of my classes were carrying all of my books because once you walk that far on foot, you're not walking back home until it's time to go home for good. But beyond the physical campus, the hilltop represents the culmination of the intellectual and spiritual journey you have undergone while you were here. You have been climbing this academic slope for at least three or four years for some of you, maybe even a little bit more. <laughs> Throughout ancient times, institutions of learning have been built on top of hills to convey that great struggle is required to achieve degrees of enlightenment. Each of you had your own unique difficulties with the hill. For some of you, the challenge was actually academics. When you hear the words magna cum laude, Cum laude, you know that's, that's not you. That's not you. You, you, you worked hard, you, you did your best, but you didn't make A's or B's, sometimes C's. You never made the Dean's list, but that's okay. You're here on top of the hill. And I want to say something to that. You know, sometimes your grades don't, 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 don't give a, 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 a real indication of what your greatness might be. So it really is okay. For others, it was financial. You and your family struggled to make ends meet every semester of your matriculation. You had to stand in one line to get to another line, to get to another line for somebody that might help you. You had to work an extra job or two, but you're here. For a lot of you, not all, but, but a lot of you, your hardest struggle was social. Some of you never fit in. You, you were never as cool and as popular as you wanted to be, and it, and it bothers you. So your social struggles here became psychological. Even though you made it up the hill, you carry the baggage of rejection with you, but you're here. Or some of you went through something traumatic. You made it to the top of the hill, but, but not without scars and bruises. Some of you fit in too much. <laughs> you were on the yard rapping on your frat block when you were supposed to be in class. <laughs> or you got caught up in the D.C. party life. I, I know how that is. I mean, we're right here in the midst of the city. Sometimes you forgot you were in school. You probably could have graduated with honors, but instead you are getting an oh yeah degree today. <laughs> oh yeah, I have class. Oh yeah, I have that paper due. Oh yeah, I have a final. You were literally too cool for school. <laughs> you waited until the last minute to do your best work, and it's a wonder that you made it up the hill at all because you carry the baggage of too much acceptance. 
Most of you graduating here today struggle against one or more of the impediments or obstacles I've mentioned in order to reach this hilltop. When completing a long climb, one first experiences dizziness, disorientation, and shortness of breath due to the high altitude. But once you become accustomed to the climb, your mind opens up to the tranquility of the triumph. Oftentimes, the mind is flooded with realizations that were for some reason harder to come to when you were at a lower elevation. At this moment, most of you need some realizations because right now you have some big decisions to make. Right now, I urge you, in your breath, in your, in your eyes, in your, in, your, in your consciousness, invest in the importance of this moment and cherish it. I, I know some of you might have partied last night. You should, you should celebrate, but this moment is also part of that celebration. So savor the taste of your triumphs today. Don't just swallow the moment whole without digesting what has actually happened here. Look down over what you conquered and appreciate what God has brought you through. Some of you here struggled against the university itself. This year, students protested and took over the A building, formulated a list of demands and negotiated with our president and administration to determine the direction of our institution. It's impressive. Similarly, during my years here at Howard, we also protested and took over the A building. In order to preserve Howard's alum, annual, in order to preserve Howard's annual appropriations from Congress, President H. Patrick Swagger decided to, re to reduce the number of colleges at the university. By his plan, engineering would need to merge with architecture. Nursing would merge with allied health. And the fine arts, my school, would be absorbed by arts and sciences. That's how we saw it, absorbed. <laughs> For many of us in fine arts, this signaled to us that our cur curriculums or the curriculums of students following us might become watered down concentrations. This undermined the very legacy we were proud to be a part of and aim to continue. The Fine Arts program had produced Felicia Rashad, yeah. Debbie Allen, yeah. Isaiah Washington, yeah. Richard Wesley, yeah. Donnie Hathaway, yeah. Roberta Flack, yeah. just to name a few. We, we felt that, yes, yes, you can go on and on. You can go on and on. You can go on and on. We felt that we could compete with students from Juilliard, NYU, and Cal Lars as long as we continued to have a, a concentrated dosage that rivaled a conservatory experience. But without it, although we took over the A building for several days and presented our arguments to President Swaggart and the administration, the schools were still merged. Thus, the current collection or formation of schools exists. That's why I view your recent protests as such an accomplishment for, for both sides of the debate, student and administration. I didn't come here to take sides. My interest is what's best for the school. A Howard University education is not just about what happens in the classroom, students. In some ways, what, what you were able to do exemplifies some of the skills you learned in the classroom. It takes the education out of the realm of theory and into utility and practice. Obviously, your organization skills were unprecedented. I'm told that you organized shifts so that you could at least continue some of your classes. We missed all our classes. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we were in the A building. And I'm told that through donations, there was always an ample helping of food. I probably ate a slice of pizza during the entirety of our, our three-day protest. So your organization and planning was impeccable. You received the majority of your demands, making a significant impact on those who came after you. 
As is often the case, those that follow most often enjoy the results of the progress you gain. You love the university enough to struggle with it. Now I have to ask you that you have, you have to continue to do that. Even now that you received your demands, even if you're walking today, you have to continue to do that. Everything that you fought for was not for yourself. It was for those that come after. You could have been disgruntled and transferred, but you fought to be participants in making this institution the best that it can be. But I must also applaud President Wayne Frederick and the administration for listening to the students. Your freedom of speech was exercised in a way where you can contribute to this place. It also shows that you can contribute to the democracy. The administration and the campus police at the time when I was pro protesting was not nearly as open-minded as this current one. I know this was a difficult time, but because of both of you, I believe Howard is a few steps closer to the actualization of its potential, the potential that many of us have dreamed for it. Students, your protests are also promising because many of you will leave Howard and enter systems and institutions that have a, have a history of discrimination and marginalization. The fact that you have struggled with this university that you love is a sign that you can use your education to improve the world that you are entering. I was on a roll when I entered the system of entertainment, theater, television, and film. In my first New York audition for a professional play, I landed the lead role. From that play, I got my first agent. From that agent, I got an on-screen audition. It was a soap opera. It wasn't Third Watch. It was a soap opera on a major network. I scored that role, too. I felt like Mike Tyson when he first came on the scene, knocking out opponents in the first round. With this soap opera gig, I was already promised to make six, six figures, more money than I had ever seen. I was feeling myself. But once I got the first script, and with soap operas, you very often get the script the night before, and you shoot the whole episode in one day with little to no time to prepare. Once I saw the role I was playing, I found myself conflicted. The role wasn't necessarily stereotypical. A young man in his formative years with a violent streak pulled into the allure of gang involvement. That's somebody's real story. Never judge the characters you play. That's what we were always taught. That's, that's the first rule of acting. And any role played honestly can be empowering. But I was conflicted because this role seemed to be wrapped up in assumptions about us as black folk. The writing failed to search for specificity. Plus, there was barely a glimpse of positivity or talent in the character barely a glimpse of hope. I would have to make something out of nothing. I was conflicted. Howard had instilled in me a certain amount of pride, and for my taste, this role didn't live up to those standards. It was just my luck that after filming the first two episodes, execs of the show called me into their office and offices and told me how happy they were with my performance. They wanted me to be around for a long time. They said, if there was anything that I needed, just let them know. That was my opening. I decided to ask them some simple questions about the background of, of my character, questions that I felt were pertinent to the plot. Question number one, where's my father? The exec, the exec answered, he left when you were younger. Of course. Okay. Okay. Question number two. If this script, in this script, it alluded to my mother not being equipped to operate as a good parent. So why, why exactly would, would my little brother and I have to go into foster care? Matter-of-factly, he answered, well, of course, she's on heroin. 
That could be real, I guess. But I didn't want to assume that's what it was. If, if we're around here assuming that the black characters in the show are criminals on drugs and deadbeat parents, then that would probably, probably be stereotypical, wouldn't it? That word stereotypical lingered. One of the execs pulled out my resume and began studying it. The other exec wore a smile trying to live up to what they had promised me only a few moments before. If there's anything you need, just let us know. She said, as, as you have seen, things move really fast around here. But we are more, more than happy to connect you with the writers if you have suggestions. Yeah, I said, that, that would be great, I said, because I'm just trying to do my homework on this. I, I, didn't, I didn't know if you guys had decided on all the facts, but maybe there are some things we could come up with, some talent or gift that we could build. Maybe he's really good at math or something. He has to be active. I'm doing my best not to play this, this character like a victim. So you went to Howard University, huh? The exec holding my resume interrupted, peeking over the pages. Yes, I said proudly. He slid my resume back in his desk and said, thank you for your concerns. We'll be watching you. I left the office. I shot the episode I had come in to shoot on that, on that day. Probably the best one I did out of the three because I got what was bothering me off my chest. I was let go from that job on the next day. A, call, a phone call from my agent. They decided to go another way. The questions that I asked set the producers on guard and perhaps paved the way for a less stereotypical portrayal for the black actor that stepped into the role after me. As the scripture says, I planted the seed and Apollos watered it. But God kept growing. God kept it growing. Yet and still, when you invest in a seed, watching it grow without you, that is a bitter pill to swallow. A bitter pill. Anybody that's ever been fired knows what I'm talking about. Even if you really don't want the job, when they let you go, it's like any breakup. You act like you don't care. I didn't need that damn job anyway. <laughs> I didn't need them. But when you have those moments alone, you start to wonder if there was a better way to handle it. And if you could have, if you could have handled it better, maybe you could help your family. And, and then before you know it, you're broke. And you find yourself scraping together change just so you can ride the subway so that you can get the next job. And maybe if you could book something else, that would eclipse the feeling of doubt that's building. But it seems like you can't pay them to hire you now. My agents at the time told me it might be a while before I got a job acting on screen again. But that was fine because I never wanted to act in the, in the first place. I, and I definitely didn't want to be caught dead going after a fake Hollywood pipe dream. I'm more of a writer-director anyway, so forget their stories. I can tell my own stories. But, but am I actually blackballed? Well, we're, we're hesitant about sending you out to some people right now because there is a stigma that you're difficult. As conflicted as I was before I lost the job, as adamant as I, I was about the need to speak truth to power, I found myself even more conflicted afterwards. I stand here today knowing that my Howard University education prepared me to play Jackie Robinson, James Brown, Thurgood Marshall, and T'Challa. But what do you do when the principles and standards that were instilled in you here at Howard close the doors in front of you? Sometimes you need to get knocked down before you can really figure out what your, what your fight is and how you need to fight it. At some point, my mom reverted back to my experiences here, to the professors that challenged me and struggled against me. Professor Roberts Williams, Doc Singleton, George Epstein, to name a few, the ones that, that would fail you out of the goodness of their hearts. <laughs> And this may be hard to grasp for some, for some of you right now, but I even considered President Swagger 
and how negotiating with him was practice for a world that was considerably more cruel and unforgiving than any debate here. One that had no interest in my ideals and beliefs. How would I maneuver through all of this? Finally, I thought of Ali in the middle of the yard. In his elder years, drawing from his victories and his losses. At that moment, I realized something new about this, the greatness of Ali and how he carried his crown. I realized that he was transferring something to me on that day. He was transferring the spirit of the fighter in me. He was, he was transferring the spirit of the fighter to me. He was transferring the spirit of the fighter to me. Sometimes you need to feel the pain and sting of defeat to activate the real passion and purpose that God predestined inside of you. God says in Jeremiah, I know the plans I have for you. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Graduating class, hear me well on this day. When you had this day, when you have reached the hilltop and you are deciding on, on next jobs, next steps, careers, further education, you would rather find purpose than a job or a career. Purpose crosses disciplines. Purpose is an essential element of you. It is the reason you are on the planet at this particular time in history. Your very existence is wrapped up in the things you are here to fulfill. Whatever you choose for a career path, remember the struggles along the way are only meant to shape you for your purpose. When I dared to challenge the system that would relegate us to victims and stereotypes with no clear historical backgrounds, no hopes or talents, when I questioned that method of portrayal, a different path opened up for me. The path to my destiny. When God has something for you, it doesn't matter who stands against it. God will move someone that's holding you back away from a door and put someone there who will open it for you. If it's meant for you, I don't know what your future is. But if you're willing to take the harder way, the more complicated one, the one with more failures at first than successes, the one that has ultimately proven to have more meaning, more victory, more glory, then you will not regret it. Now, this is your time. <laughs> the light of new realization shines on you today. Howard's legacy is not wrapped up in the money that you will make, but the challenges that you choose to confront. As you commence to your past, press on with pride and press on with purpose. God bless you. I love you, Howard. Howard forever.